but uh, this is actually you. All right, thank you very much. So, what I want to talk about tonight is not about the content of politics or political ideology, but I want to talk about uh, the way that we come to believe what we do believe about politics, the way we come to form the attitudes uh, that we have uh, in the political sphere. And I want to debunk a little bit of a myth, which is that we are rational about this kind of stuff, that we actually have informed judgments that are rationally considered and we can justify those uh, with good reasons and with evidence. So I want to just start by posing a bit of a puzzle. Let's say you know somebody, just for the sake of argument, let's call him Tony. And let's say Tony believes that climate change is absolute crap. Now, if you knew that about Tony, if you knew that he held that attitude, do you think you would be able to make a prediction? Do you think you'd be able to guess his stance on a range of other issues? Things like welfare or taxation or uh, uh, environment or law and order. Do you think if you knew his strongly held belief in one area, you would be able to predict his views in other areas? And the interesting thing is, well, you can. Uh, there's plenty of evidence to show that if you know that somebody, for example, has very strong views on uh, law and order, a zero tolerance approach, very tough on crime, you can probably guess their views on a bunch of other uh, issues as well. They're probably going to be more likely to be pro-capital punishment, more likely to be uh, anti-same-sex ma marriage, uh, more likely to be pro-border protection. Um, and this is because there's that interesting phenomenon where political attitudes cluster. So if we take a progressive worldview or a liberal worldview in the, in the traditional sense, you see that there are a bunch of attitudes, I hope they're visible up there, that tend to link together. And not all of these appear to be associated. So for example, someone's, why is there someone's view on the environment linked to their view on abortion? Or linked to their view on having a strong social safety net? Or linked to their view on uh, allowing asylum seekers into the country? A lot of these views don't appear to have any kind of connection with each other. Likewise, for a conservative view, why is it that someone who is, is going to be uh, low taxation and low spending from the government tends to also want to spend more on something like defence or spend more on something like uh, crime and, and law and order. So now, we want to know why people form these unusual clusters of beliefs that they form, what patterns there are underneath the surface. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. One is the top-down way, one is the bottom-up way. The top-down one is the approach taken in the traditional political science view. Now this idea says that uh, there are political ideologies and they're created by elites and they then trickle down to the people. And when the people are confronted by these, uh, these ideas, by these political uh, ideologies, whether it's say libertarianism or whether it's socialism, whether it's Marxism, uh, whether it's traditional conservatism, they then um, accept or reject that based on rational consideration of their own lives, of their personal circumstances, self-interest. If I'm a worker, I might be more inclined to go for a labour policy. If I run a business, I might be more inclined to go for a low-tax liberal policy, for example. And the idea is that we have this rational approach to these, uh, these ideologies as they're presented to us, and we pick the best one for the problems that we think the world faces. Do we need lower taxation or not? Well, let me look at the numbers. Let me look at the arguments for that, and I'll pick the right solution for that. However, the evidence doesn't necessarily support this view in terms of how we promote or how we understand uh, how people come to their political attitudes. Because a lot of reasons that people have for their political attitudes don't actually hold water. A lot of them look a lot like post hoc justifications. So if you take, and I'm sure you've had arguments like this over dinner tables or at the pub, say someone like Tony, who doesn't believe that climate change is a real issue, doesn't believe that there's anything serious about it, uh, the science is, is crap, for example. You might present them with a lot of arguments about the science and they might not be convinced at all. They might not change their mind. In fact, they might return to you their reason for believing that the science is crap by saying that uh, a price on carbon is going to cripple our economy. Now, that's a non sequitur. These are separate issues, economics and science. So, I'm not entirely convinced that the political science model is a good explanation of why we come to the beliefs that we have. So, let's go to the bottom-up approach. This is the view uh, from political psychology. This is a new field 
that's only emerged in about the last 10 or 15 years. And I think it's a really exciting um, area of, of research that's going on. This starts not with political ideology at the top and trickling down. It starts with people at the bottom. It starts thinking about how we think, what our makeup is, what our psychological makeup is, uh, what kind of heuristics we employ, uh, what kind of personality types we have, the variables between different people, and how these influence our worldview, how these influence the way that we see the world as being. Um, and from this perspective, so let me just give you one very quick example. Let's say somebody has a stronger fear response. They might perceive the world as being a more threatening place. That's a part of their worldview. So when you present to that person something like, uh, you know, the world's full of bad guys on the streets, we need tough crime, we need harsh punishments and get them off the streets to protect you, that kind of makes some more sense. If you don't have a, a strong fear response, you might have a different experience of the world and you might not uh, necessarily believe that a tough on crime approach is, is the right way to go. This is a bit of a hint of how it all works. So a political ideology then uh, is attractive or repulsive depending on your uh, psychological makeup and the way that you see the world as being. And what seems to happen is that if you see the world as a threatening place, for example, you might be more drawn towards ideologies that represent the world as a threatening place and, and offer solutions to the world as being a threatening place. But then when you're attracted to that, you then find yourself being reinforced in your view. Because once you become, for example, a tough on crime conservative, you're buying into that view that the world actually is a tough place. And a lot of rhetoric is supporting that view. It kind of feeds back on itself. And uh, so what happens is it seems as though with your particular psychological makeup and your worldview, you have an emotional response to a particular political idea, attitude, or an ideology. And that emotional response causes you to latch on to that idea. And then after that, you come up with some post hoc justifications, which is what we do about so many things. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about a few of these variables, a few of these psychological variables. Uh, that are being looked at in political psychology and how they influence our political views. So what I want to look at is, is called a need for closure, which is defined as um, a preference for any firm belief on a given topic as opposed to confusion and uncertainty. Some people are, to are tolerant of confusion and uncertainty. Other people are very intolerant of that. And it seems that interesting when you look at this personality variable, those who are intolerant of uncertainty, they tend to lean towards conservative uh, attitudes. Another one is perception of threat, which I've already mentioned, which is seeing the world as a dangerous place or whether you see people being fundamentally good or fundamentally bad. And this seems to be just the way that people confront the world and deal with the world and then that influences their political views. So people who, not surprisingly, see the world as a more dangerous place uh, tend towards a conservative um, outlook. Another one, this one I think is really interesting, it's called integrative complexity, I see. People who have a high I see synthesize a lot of information when they're trying to make a decision. They look at an issue from many, many different directions and they look at it from many, di many different dimensions before they come to their view. New evidence can change their mind. And it seems as though people with a lower IC tend to tilt towards political conservatism. I think a really good example of this, if, if you can remember the 2004 American uh, presidential election, conservatives praised George W. Bush for his black and white clear thinking decisiveness. He had an issue, he knew what he felt about it, he just went out and did something about it. Conservatives on the other hand criticised John Kerry for, as this image say, it says, having many different positions on an issue because John Kerry had a high IC. He would look at lots of different bits of evidence, he would take a long time to come to a decision, new evidence would change his mind. Conservatives thought that was a bad thing. Liberals thought that was a good thing. This one's called right-wing authoritarianism, and the title gives a little bit away about what it's all about. People who score highly, and there's a whole test that you can do to see if you score highly on RWA. Those who score highly on RWA tend to be very conventional, very dogmatic, very rigid, very conformist. They also tend to have authoritarian submission. They like structure, they like hierarchies, and they don't want to be at the top of those hierarchies. They feel more comfortable being in the middle or lower down. Um, and authoritarian aggression, which is another way of just punishing non-conformists. And not surprisingly, people who score highly on RWA tend to hold conservative attitudes on a range of different issues. Now we're on to Just World, and this is one of my favourite thought experiments. 
So Just World is basically, do you think that the world rewards people for the effort and the energy that they put into it? So if you believe it's a just world, you work hard, you get the reward. If it's an unjust world, you work hard, whether you get a reward or not is random. Now they did this thought experiment where they've got a group of people and they gave them a, a hypothetical world. Okay, you live in a just world, work hard, get a reward. What kind of a, a welfare policy should we have in that world? And just about everybody in the group said, well, we should have pretty low welfare because if you work hard, you're going to get benefit. If you don't work hard, you don't deserve anything. Then they said, okay, well, what if the world is unjust? What if you work really hard and whether you get a reward or not? Yeah. Um, what kind of welfare? Well, they said, okay, just about everyone, we should have more welfare because you, you could be working really hard, be unlucky, we should give you a safety net. But then when they said, when the researchers said, well, we don't, what if we don't know? What if we don't know if the world is just or unjust? What kind of a welfare policy should we have? And people split off into two broad groups. One group assumed they saw the world, they believed the world was just. One group saw the world as being unjust and they had corresponding views about uh, welfare based on whether the world was just or not. And not surprisingly, those who held generally conservative attitudes saw the world as being just. You work hard, you get the reward. Those who held generally liberal attitudes saw the world as being unjust. People could work hard and be unlucky and that explained why they held the particular views on welfare that they held. But they didn't necessarily ever articulate that they thought the world was just or not. That was just sitting under the surface. So now, let's get more general. This is the classic uh, ocean uh, five-factor personality. So you've got openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. These are personality variables and you can do tests to see where you sit on these. What's really interesting about this is that conservatism is correlated with having low openness to new experiences. So that's being not as, as open to new ideas and experimental and, and, and imaginative. Uh, and high conscientiousness, which is being, I don't know, more punctual. And the converse is true for progressive or, or uh, old school liberal attitudes. The interesting thing about the five factors, the ocean, is these are strongly heritable. These are, you're kind of born with the personality that you have, and it doesn't vary to a great degree during your life. Now that actually, to me, hints at a really interesting biological or a genetic angle to this, something I'm not going to talk about here, but which I've uh, discussed more in my, in my own research. So, let's go back to that puzzle about why people come to the attitudes that they have. And let's debunk that idea that we are impartial blank slates, that we are rational, that we look at these ideas and take them on their merits. Because it seems as though the psychology is different between people who lean conservative and lean uh, progressive or lean liberal. Now, of course, this is an overlapping thing and there's a lot of blurring and there's a tremendous amount of environmental influence here, but the environment does not account for the entirety of the variability of people's views. There's something interesting going on with our psychology. And you can see these ideas cluster together. So conservatives perceive the world as being more threatening, uh, a more pessimistic view of human nature, uh, they're more resistant to change, more tolerant of authority, more suspicious of outgroup members, and the converse is true of progressives. Now, if this is the case, I think this is a genuine revelation. I think this actually forces us to reconsider our own political views, forces us to think about how is it that I am looking at the world? How am I seeing the world and how is that influencing how I form my beliefs? And how is that got anything to do with the justifications that I'm telling thumping tables at you know, dinner parties to explain why I believe what I believe? And I think it, it, it causes us to rethink how we argue with other people as well. As I was saying earlier, if you're arguing with someone with a disagreement, maybe throwing more evidence at them, more reasons, more facts, more arguments, is not necessarily going to change their mind. Maybe what we need to do is understand the way they see the world, understand their psychology, understand, well, crime and punishment, if they see the world as being a threatening place and people as being generally bad, and we just say, well, no, rehabilitation is better than punishment. It might not get through until we understand their perspective and maybe change the way they see the world. So imagine taking someone who thinks the world is just, let's give them evidence that the world is unjust, and maybe their views on welfare will just tumble out of that if we think they're the right views. Um, so I think political psychology is something that's very exciting. It's, very, it's reasonably new. And I think it, it causes us to rethink the way that we approach uh, politics in general. Thank you very much.
Thank you.